the Linux kernel mailing list is absolutely no stranger to really bizarre interactions, and it does make sense. There are tons of developers on the mailing list from all walks of life, and a lot of them are working really, really hard, and many of them are probably really stressed out. But today, I want to talk about one interaction in particular between Kent Overstreet, Sasha Levin, and Greg Crower Hartman. But before we get to that, I need to give you a bit of context about who these people are. So Kent is the lead developer on Bcache FS. If the FS didn't give it away, this is a file system, which often gets compared to things like ButterFS and ZFS. Now to be fair, they make the comparisons themselves. Other benefits presented by Bcache FS include a focus on reliability, robustness, and performance. Bcache FS is safer to use than ButterFS and is also shown to outperform ZFS in terms of speed and reliability. Now, Sasha does many, many different things, but in this case, what's important is that he's worked on something called AutoCell. Basically, a neural network, which I know is scary with all of the AI stuff going on, but this has been in use for many years now. A neural network for sorting through the absolute mess of kernel patches to determine if an untagged fix is still suitable to be merged into the kernel. If you'd like to learn more about this system, check out a couple of LWN posts. The first one being maintaining stable stability, the second one machine learning and stable kernels. I'm not going to read them here, but I'll leave them linked in the description down below. Greg is also many things. He is the second in command after Linus. If Linus isn't around, basically what Greg says goes, but also he's the LTS guy. So all of this started with a very simple email from Kent. Hi, stable team. Please don't take patches for FS slash Bcache FS except from myself. I'll be doing backports and sending pull requests after stuff has been tested by my CI. Thanks, and let me know if there's any other workflow things I should know about. This might seem fairly weird coming from the context of a small project, but for something at the scale of the kernel, this is actually a fairly common workflow. Oftentimes, the different sections of the kernel are basically maintained as their own separate projects with one person eventually sending things upstream. If you want to learn more about that, check out my video on why GitHub cannot be used to manage the entire kernel development. This doesn't mention any commits in particular, but I have a feeling some commits were sent upstream without him knowing about them, and he had to go and fix them, and he was like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Probably happened multiple times in the past. And he's like, you know what? I'm just going to run the sub-project and not have to deal with this issue. Now, the first response was from Sasha. Sure, we can ignore fs slash bcache fs patches. Note that the proposed workflow would only work through patches coming through your tree, but patches in other subsystems that could affect bcache fs might break it in stable trees without being caught by your CI. I'd recommend integrating your pre-release tests with something like kernel CI, which would let us catch bcachefs affecting issues coming from other sources. What more, if we do the above, we could in the future avoid special casing bcachefs. Now we'll get to this right here in a moment, but before we get to that, there was a separate reply chain started by Greg. Now done. As we can see over here, the ignore list has now been updated. We will ignore it for any fixes, tags, or auto sell, but if you explicitly add a CC stable in the signed off by area, we will pick that up. This is going to cause you more work, but less for us. So thanks. That last email was on the 16th, and it seemed like from there, everything was good. The process was in place, all patches not from Kent for BcacheFS were going to be ignored. Until the 20th, when a patch did get accepted, and Kent isn't the one who sent it. He wasn't too happy about this. I see you've even acted this, as in, you've acknowledged this. What the F? This kicked off a giant thread <laughs> of people complaining back and forth. Let's get started with it. However... That wasn't what he said that caused the thread. Greg replied with, Accidents happen, you were copied on those patches. 
I'll go drop them now. Not a big deal. Thanks. And that should have been the end of the thread. And then Greg noticed something. Wait, why are you doing fixes with an empty tag in your commits like bcashfs fix missing bch2 er class calls? That being this commit right here. Fixes has absolutely nothing after it. That's messing with scripts and doesn't make much sense. Please put a real git ID in there as the documentation suggests to. Specifically, what it says is if your patch fixes a bug in a specific commit, e.g. you found an issue using git bisect, please use the fixes tag with the first 12 characters of the SHA-1 ID and the one line summary. Do not split the tag across multiple lines. Tags are exempt from the wrap at 75 columns rule in order to simplify parsing scripts. For example, do this right here, not have absolutely nothing there. To which Kent had a very interesting reply. I don't agree with it in most cases, but here's what he said. There isn't always a clear-cut commit when a regression was introduced, it might not have been a regression at all. I could dig and make something up, but that's slowing down your workflow. And I thought I was going to be handling all the stable backports for fs slash bcache fs. So? Besides the kind of snarky end comment here, basically what he's saying here is, oftentimes the replication conditions for an issue aren't entirely clear. You might change between various different patches and see the issues get fixed and come back and get fixed and come back because you're not entirely sure on what's causing the issue to happen, but you still know a way to address the issue. A good example of this is some of the old Hyperland issues I had regarding portals. There are new portal related issues, but the old ones oftentimes cause the portals to just not be opened when I open up OBS. And at some point, that just stopped happening. And I've spoken to Vaxry about it, and he doesn't know why it stopped happening. Eventually, he did a rewrite of the portals, and the problem just went away. So something changed with the way that he did it. But if you were to say specifically which commit caused the problem to happen in the first place, he doesn't really know. I completely understand what he's getting at from his perspective. However... Greg didn't want to hear any of it. Doesn't matter. Please do not put fake tags in commit messages like this. It hurts all of the people that parse commit logs. Just don't put a fixes tag at all, as the documentation states that after fixes, a commit ID belongs. Thanks, Greg Carl Hartman. Even if it does fix a bug, you don't need to include the commit ID. Including it is nice and makes it so things are very clearly linked together, but it is optional, which is especially important when there might be a large range of commits all related to the exact same bug where different commits introduce different problems but are all related to the exact same larger issue. Then Kent snapped back again. Then there's a gap because I need a tag that I can stick in a commit message that says this is a bug fix I need to consider backporting later and the way you want the fixes tag doesn't meet my needs. It meets the needs of thousands of other developers but in this one specific instance, it can't be used. That's not how things in the kernel tend to go down. Then use patchwork or something else, but please do not override a 15 plus year old tag for just one small portion of the kernel. Or better yet, use fixes tag with the commit ID you are fixing, that way all other kernel workflows work properly with this file system. No need to be unique here. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, Patchwork is basically a external, basically commit management tool. It's used to just track what certain commits do, why they are here, all of this sort of stuff outside of the Git system. Kent's final comment for this part of the thread, stop trying to blame this on your scripts or the fixes tag. There's a real lack of communication there. You can't say you're going to do one thing and then do the complete opposite. As you can tell, he is still very, very salty that a commit was accepted when he explicitly said, hey, don't accept the commits unless they are from me. And I totally understand why he has a problem with that, 
But that's not exactly what's being talked about at this moment. Ken also went on to reply to another part of the thread. So you manually repicked a subset of my pull request, and of the two patches you silently dropped, one was a security fix, and you never communicated what you were doing. Greg, this isn't working. How are we going to fix this? I explicitly said, not all of these applied properly, please send me the remaining ones. I can go back and get the message ID if you want receipts. Never ask someone who spends all of their time looking at the mailing list if you have receipts, because they probably do. Please send a set of backporter commits that you wish to have applied to the stable trees. All other subsystems do this fairly easily. It's no different from sending a patch series out for anything else. Worst case, I can take a git tree, but I will then turn that git tree into individual commits as that is what we must deal with for the stable trees. We cannot work with direct pull requests for obvious reasons of how the trees need to be managed, i.e. rebasing all the time would never work. Now, as is often the case when someone brings up, hey, I couldn't merge your patches, he says, there were no merge conflicts. I don't know what Greg saw then if there were no merge conflicts, because clearly there were merge conflicts. And then once again, went on about rebasing trees. Literally just after Greg explained why they have the system in place that they have in place. And Greg was clearly just done with this conversation, so he gave the best possible reply. Hi, this is the friendly email bot of the stable kernel team. I've detected that you are asking a question that has been discussed many times in the past. If you wish to contact the stable developers directly, please use their phone hotline, 1-800-382-5633. And then has this giant transcript explaining everything that's going on in a sort of text bot like system i have a feeling that this is not the first time he's posted this if it is this is psycho behavior for anyone curious 1-800-382-5633 is 1-800-f off the only reason this entire argument had to happen in the first place is because of scripts like the one made by sasha is this really how you communicate with other humans so what happened here is that my script apparently crashes on empty fixes annotations. It can deal with invalid commits, various combinations of SHA-1 and description, but apparently not with just nothing at all. And so I fixed my scripts. So hopefully this shouldn't happen again. But I'd ask for two things. Firstly, next time you should mail me, could you try and be more civil? Secondly, consider fixing your scripts. The documentation is pretty explicit as to how fixes tags are supposed to look like. Never forget that open source projects, even projects like the kernel, are just made by regular people. And sometimes regular people are having a bad day, and sometimes regular people just act in a way that isn't really that friendly. And this is one instance of that. It doesn't make him a bad person, but it is kind of funny. And I love that all of the communication with the Colonel is completely public for everybody to read. Because it makes you realize that if you want to get involved in the Colonel, you probably can. On that note, we're done here. I'll leave all of the emails linked down below. There is a lot more after this that is kind of unrelated to the main point I wanted to get at here, but is still maybe worth a read. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. If you like the video, go like the video. And if you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon scribes Libera Pay linked in the description down below. That's going to be it for me and... I am the only person crazy enough to sit here and read emails and somehow make a video out of it.